So good afternoon and welcome to those of you that have joined. We have just opened the link, so we will just wait for a few minutes to allow everybody to join before we start. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Five Stone Buildings webinar program. We have just opened the link, so we're just waiting for a few minutes to allow everybody to join before we start. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Five Stone Buildings webinar program. I will now hand over to Luke Harris. Well, hello, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this uh, Five Stone Buildings webinar. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about art cases and specifically the role of trusts and bailment in relation to art um, matters. Um, just before we begin, I, I'm asked to um, read out a few um, basic housekeeping points. Um, first of all, there is at the bottom of the screen a question and answer box. So if you've got any questions um, throughout, then please do uh, feel free to type them in and I'll do my best to deal with them towards the end of the seminar. Um, I should say the webinar is being recorded. So if you don't want to be identified when you're asking a question, then you can tick the anonymous box. Um, so if you think you're going to trip me up, but you don't want me to know who you are, then that's what you're um, supposed to do. And I won't identify you, of course. Um, we'll be able to, you'll be able to access a recording, copy of the recording um, through various sources, I think on our website um, as well. Um, and if you've got any questions after the seminar's finished, then please do feel free to get in touch and follow up with me and I'll be happy to try and assist as best I can. So um, without further ado, let's, let's get going. Um, the, the, the seminar, as I say, uh, is, is, is about the role or the interaction between the law of trusts and the law of uh, bailment. Um, in light of the likely audience uh, to this seminar, I doubt I'll need to spend very much time outlining what a trust is. The essential feature of the trust, though, for present purposes, is that it involves a distinction between the, um, or a division, I should say, between the um, property holding function and the beneficial enjoyment of the property. And the trust is an equitable structure under which uh, one person is vested with the property and another person has the right to enjoy it. And for my money, perhaps the best definition is the one that I've put up there uh, from Underhill on the law of trusts, which is uh, pretty much the first 
um, sentence of the book, which outlines, I think, very, very well the, the core features of the duty. Uh, now, the bailment relationship, which is less well understood by, um, by many, is also a relationship which involves the division of interests in property. But in this case, it involves the division of legal ownership from possession. So whereas with the trust, it's the property holding function, often said to be legal ownership, but of course not necessarily because trusts can have equitable property as a subject matter as well. Uh, so it's the property holding function from beneficial ownership in the case of the trust. With the bailment, it's the legal title uh, separated from um, possession. And it's important to say that bailment is a common law relationship and it's not a relationship which has any equitable aspect at all. Now turning just for a moment to the creation of trusts of artwork, there are really no special um, principles, um, broadly speaking, that you need to have in mind when you're considering trusts of artwork as opposed to trusts, trusts of other property. Um, artwork um, is of course, or are, are chattels, and therefore the law of trusts as they apply to chattels um, applies to works of art generally. So you can have, of course, express, express trust by declaration of trusts or by transfer to trustees. Um, in the case of a transfer to trustees, given the subject matter of the trust is likely um, will, or will be a, a chattel uh, being an artwork, it will be either by deed or by a common law transfer by delivery. The rules on resulting trusts and constructive trusts will generally apply in the same way as they do to other forms of property. But there are going to be some differences which you need to keep in mind and which you, you should be aware of. So for example, it's said uh, by, by some commentators that the presumption of resulting trust may not have quite such a role to play in relation to transfers of chattels as in relation to transfers of other property. So you'll recall that the presumption of resulting trust um, holds that if there's been a gratuitous transfer of property from one person to another, then unless the contrary is proved, the transferee is taken to hold it on trust for the transfer all. Now, where you have a transfer of a chattel, uh, if you have simply delivery, which is an ingredient of transfer, but nothing more, that probably doesn't give rise uh, to any kind of presumption of a conveyance of title. Uh, so it's essentially neutral because it's as consistent with a loan or some form of bailment as with a, an outright disposition. If you want to prove that you've got an outright disposition, uh, you have to establish that there was an intention to give on the part of the transferor at the time of uh, the delivery. And if you can establish intention to give and delivery, you've established the transfer, but there's not really much role there uh, for a, presu a presumption of resulting trust to operate. So it's probably squeezed out just by the, the nature of the formalities for transfer. Although admittedly that, that point wouldn't apply if it was a transfer on paper by, by deed. Um, another possible distinction is in relation to constructive trusts. If you go to the law of the sale of goods, you'll find that the Sale of Goods Act provides a complete code for the transfer of property and goods. And that uh, squeezes out the idea uh, which you find in conveyances of land and probably in, in, with regard to conveyances of other personal property apart from chattels that a specifically enforceable contract uh, gives rise before the conveyance of any legal interest to a constructive trust of the property. This is what they called the, the, the rule in Walsh and Lonsdale. Um, a case called reweight establishes in the context of sales of goods that that principle doesn't apply. So I say that the law of trust will generally apply in the same way to works of art, but there are special features in relation to chattels and, and you would want to be aware of those and keep them in mind. Uh, I won't say very much about the regulation of trust interests on this slide and the next slide. Um, I just make the point here, I'll come back to this, but you can have trusts of successive interests in relation to chattels just as you can in relation to land. And it's 
generally said that it's possible to replicate all of the interests that you can have in land in chattels by use of a trust. But there is an exception to this, which is um, now perhaps really just of historical interest, which is that the, um, the law did not allow for the creation of uh, entailed interests in chattels by use of a trust. So the principle oft stated is that there is no doctrine of estates that applies in relation to personal property. And of course, an entailed interest is a form of inheritable estate, um, uh, an estate of inheritance. You couldn't get around the rule that there is no uh, principle of estates in relation to chattels by trying to create an entailed interest in the chattel by use of a trust. Now that was itself eroded as an idea between 1926 and um, 1996 uh, where legislation allowed for the creation of those interests but they can no longer be created. Um, where you have um, a trust which is a trust of land it can include uh, chattels as well. Um, unsurprisingly most of the provisions of Talata however are concerned with uh, land rather than chattels, but the court's general power in relation to the regulation of the trustees function in section 14 uh, will apply to all aspects of the trust, um, trusts of land, including in relation to chattels. Uh, if you have trusts of pure personality, the beneficiaries can control the trustees powers in the usual way, and if you are looking as the trustee to dispose of chattels which are comprised in the trust, you need to look very carefully as always at the scope of the powers that you may have available to you. And I've outlined on the screen there some of the specific powers which relate to dispositions of chattels by trustees. So what then is a bailment? I come to the bailment. Now bailment exists wherever one person is voluntarily in possession of property, the chattel, um, to which another person, the bailor, has a superior right of possession. So you'll see immediately that bailment is a relationship which is rooted in possession. It's the fact of the Bailey's possession that gives rise to the relationship of bailment and brings into being a system of personal rights um, and duties which arise as between the bailor and the Bailey. Um, the Bailey uh, has, by virtue of his possession, a possessory title. Um, the law regards a person in possession of a chattel as having an interest in the chattel, which is, in effect, a proprietary interest. And what that really means is that the Bailey's possession of the chattel gives the Bailey a right to sue, um, accessing uh, tortious rights, really, to recover and protect possession of the chattel, which really qualifies uh, the Bailey as having a, 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 an interest in, in property in the, in the item. So the bailment can be seen as operating in two dimensions. First of all, as I say, as a system of personal rights as between the bailor and the Bailey, but also as a form of conveyance under which the Bailey in possession acquires a, a limited interest in the chattel, which can then be used um, as against the rest of the world in the form of maintaining tort actions and so on against those who interfere with the chattel, try to take the chattel from the bailey, perhaps those who damage the chattel, um, and so on. Now, in the formulation of the bailment that I gave at the beginning there, I said that the bailey exists wherever one person is in voluntary possession of a chattel to which another person has a superior right of possession. Um, the bailor then in that definition um, I, I, is not necessarily the owner. So although it's often the case, perhaps even usually the case, that the bailor will be the owner and the interest of the bailor will therefore be the ownership interest at the, top of the, uh, at the top of the tree, it isn't necessarily the case that the bailor will be the owner. And you can have a system of bailment and sub-bailment and sub-sub-bailment under which each of the successive bailors in the relationship will not be the owner. The owner will be the person at the top, but the, uh, the next bailor down, or the sub-bailor, or sub-sub-bailor, will be someone who has an interest which is less than owner full ownership. 
And it's therefore convenient to talk about the bailor as having some kind of reversionary interest in the goods uh, rather than pure ownership. But it is for um, most purposes as, as well, just to speak about the bailor as the owner. As far as the bailey is concerned, um, he doesn't necessarily have possession either. The conventional case is that he will have possession, but he doesn't necessarily have possession. So as I said a moment ago, you can have sub bailments and in, that, in the case of a sub-bailment, the first bailey then passes possession on to the sub-bailey. So he occupies a link in the chain where he has neither ownership nor possession, but he still occupies a scheme in the bailment relationship. Now, it's sometimes helpful to think about bailment as being similar to uh, a leasehold structure in relation to chattels. Uh, as with all analogies, it can be misleading, but it is often convenient to think of it in that way. It's also convenient sometimes to think of the Bailey as being a little bit like, I'm going to be very careful in saying this, but a little bit like um, the equivalent of the, for the common law, of the beneficiary under a trust with a limited interest. Um, like the beneficiary under the trust, um, the Bailey's interest is proprietary, but it is circumscribed by the terms of the bailment in just the same way that the beneficiary's interest will be proprietary but circumscribed by the precise drafting of the trust instrument under which the, under which the uh, interest arises. Bailments are commonly said to um, uh, take a number of um, forms, seven forms um, were traditionally identified uh, you can see that they, under those different um, types of bailment, which I put up on the screen there, some of them will be situations where one party, be it the bailor or the bailee, um, has the benefit. So it's ben of benefit just to one of the parties. Um, a loan, for example, is uh, classically uh, only of benefit to the borrower rather than to the lender. Um, some of the relationships which are mutual um, reward situations are bailments which have benefit passing in both directions. Um, the distinction um, probably doesn't, it doesn't really matter so much under the modern law, but it, it can sometimes be seen as significant to qualifying the degree of, for example, care that the bailey has to take of the chattel and so on. You can see there that um, the, 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 the bailment, different um, examples cover um, all sorts of different structures that arise, including security interests at the bottom there in the form of a pledge or pawn, the hire of goods, warehousing, those sorts of relationships. Now, many um, of the um, bailments that arise in modern life can be seen as rooted in contract and they can be analysed as being contractual relationships. So if you take your work of art um, to a restorer to have it restored, there will generally be a contract between the parties um, and you can analyze the relationship either as being one of bailment, but equally, perhaps more naturally, you might think of it as being a relationship which is all about contract. And where the bailment is a contractual relationship, the law of contract and the law of bailment will be largely overlapping. So if you want to find uh, terms that are implied in the bailment, you'll be looking at the law on the implication of terms in relation to contracts. If you want to interpret um, what the uh, terms of the bailment are, you, which is written down, you will be looking at the law of the interpretation of written agreements and so on. But there are many bailments which arise uh, in um, the art context, which are not contractual at all. The, the loan of a work of art is an example. As I said a moment ago, a true loan is actually a gratuitous bailment. Um, sometimes you can have situations where one person agrees to look after a work of art without actually undertaking um, any corresponding undertaking on the part of the bailor. Uh, it might be a, a temporary storage of some sort or other, which is ancillary to some kind of commercial relationship. And in those circumstances, it might actually be a situation of gratuitous safekeeping on the part of the bailee. Some cases are borderline. Art loans, I've put in inverted commas there, 
um, would be an example because it's probably right actually under most modern art loans that they are bailments that are for mutual reward They're not really loans at all where which as i say are really a loan really only being of benefit to the borrower um, so some some cases are perhaps uh, borderline now if you have um, uh, some wrong committed by the bailey in respect of the the work of art uh, as I said a moment ago, you may well find that you've got a contract and in those circumstances your mind will travel to an action for breach of contract, probably as the first port of call. In many other situations you'll find that even where the, the loan is, the um, bailment is gratuitous, there will be some kind of tortious liability on the part of the bailee. So you may be able to see the bailee who damages the uh, the work of art or who um, or who negligently restores it um, for an action in tort, the bailey who fails to deliver it up at the end of the bailment may well be, almost certainly will be liable for the tort of conversion. So a lot of liability will be catered for either through contract or through tort. But what I want to do just over the next few slides is identify a couple of um, instances where the liability of the bailey is not easily identifiable as being a liability which arises in contract or in tort. And there are four um, areas that I, I just want to focus on. First of all, the Bailey's duty of care. Now the Bailey has a, 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 a duty to take reasonable care of the goods that are entrusted to them. But in the second um, bullet point there, I've said that the Bailey is also liable for the negligence of the agents or employees um, in the course of their employment, but also for any deliberate wrong committed by an agent or employee to whom the bailey has entrusted the goods and delegated any part of his duty of care. Now the law of vicarious liability is complex, but if you look carefully at it, what you will find is that the liability of the bailey um, for the wrongs of others, which I've outlined in that second bullet point, is wider than the liability which would arise under the principles of vicarious liability. And in that respect, uh, the liability of the bailey in bailment is more extensive than in tort. Um, if the bailor uh, proves the fact of the bailment and is then able to prove loss, theft, destruction or damage while the goods are in the bailey's possession, then the bailey is under the duty of disproving that the loss was caused by negligence um, or by any wrong on the part of somebody for whom he's liable under the rules that I've outlined there. Now that's again a very important difference with the law of tort because of course in negligence the burden is on the claimant to establish the wrong. Here we find that provided the Bay law is able to prove the threshold um, requirements you can flip the burden of proof onto the bailey and make him liable unless he discharges um, the duty that I've outlined. The second area which I want to identify is, is deviation. It's a fundamental principle of bailment that the bailey is not entitled to deviate from the core restrictions which are placed on him with regard to his possession. So for example, if the bailey undertakes to keep the goods in a particular place or to look after them in a particular way, those can be regarded as core features of his um, custodianship and he's not allowed to deviate from those um, features. If the bailey does deviate from those features then something um, quite perhaps quite surprising happens which is that he suddenly becomes uh, liable strictly for what happens to the goods. Um, he becomes in the language of, of, of some of the old cases liable as an insurer for the goods. So liable for, what, for, for any harm that befalls them, regardless of whether that harm is actually his fault. And he can only avoid liability for loss or damage by showing either that the fault was the fault of the bailor, or that what happened to the goods would have happened anyway, even if the deviation had not occurred. So think, for example, of a situation where the bailor bails the goods to a gallery to look after the goods, it's understood that the goods will be kept on the gallery's premises and in their strong room at place A, but without the consent of the bailor, the gallery decides for whatever reason that it wants to move the goods to a different facility 
it does that um, and they're then uh, destroyed by fire or flood. Now the fire or flood may have nothing to do with the bail or uh, the bailee's fault, completely unrelated to um, any act or omission on the part of the bailee, but that would be a fairly classic case of deviation for which the bailee would be liable and it would be difficult to see how he could escape liability on the basis of either of the um, bases set out in the fourth bullet point there. Um, then I come to gratuitous promises. Now, if a promise is contractual, you can, of course, um, sue. Sorry, I've jumped on. No, nope, I've not jumped on. I'm missing a slide. Um, if if um, the promise is, uh, is um, made in a contract, you can, of course, sue for breach of contract. But if the promise is not made in a contract, conventional wisdom would have it that you can't sue at all because it's, the, uh, it's a basic principle of English law. So we're all taught on day one of our law degree or conversion course that you cannot sue on a gratuitous promise at common law. Um, consideration must move from the promisee. But is a, what seems to be a pretty important inroad into that principle, this case, Yearworth and North Bristol, um, established that there may be exceptions to that. There are many circumstances in which a bailee will undertake promises in relation to the bailed goods. The bailee may undertake, as I've said, to uh, keep the goods in a particular place, to look after the goods in a particular way, um, to treat them in some fashion or other. Um, if, if that good, if that, um, any of those promises is broken and it's not a contractual promise, then as I say, Yearworth may provide some opportunity for bringing a claim in respect of those uh, broken promises. Yearworth was a case in which the defendant had undertaken to look after um, the, um, it was uh, sperm deposits um, of the claimants who were undergoing treatment for cancer. Um, in uh, negligent fashion, the defendant um, uh, hospital trust failed to look after those deposits. As a result, they perished. And in the course of the case, one of the questions that arose was whether or not the defendant could be liable for allowing that to happen, notwithstanding that there was actually, a, uh, it was a gratuitous undertaking on their part uh, to look after the sperm deposits. Lord Judge said of that, indeed it may be that where the gratuitous bailee has extended and broken a particular promise to his bailor, for example, that a, that a chattel will be stored in a particular place or in a particular way, the measure of damages may, may be more akin to that referable to breach of contract rather than to tort. In summary, the breach of bailment here was a breach not just of the duty owed by every gratuitous bailee, but of a specific promise extended by the trust to the men. The law of bailment provides them with a remedy under which in principle they're entitled to compensation for any psychiatric injury or actionable distress foreseeably consequent upon the breach. So it's a very interesting idea, but the, the, the clear indication is that the, bail, that the bail law can sue on gratuitous promises which are annexed, if you like, to the bailment. So if they're a fundamental feature, at least, of the terms upon which the bailey assumed possession, then they may be actionable. And I think here what we, we see perhaps is the bailment relationship operating um, almost in a proprietary way. It's because it's a fundamental feature of the Bailey's interest that they take um, the, their interest on those terms um, and those terms are then held to be enforceable by the Bay Law. Um, the last area which is unusual or special I think about bailment that I want to identify anyway is the doctrine of sub bailment on terms and this can be seen very clearly operating in a case called the Pioneer Container. Now what had happened in the Pioneer Container was that the shipper the shipper of goods um, had, um, bet, sub, had bailed the goods to the carrier on terms which allowed the carrier uh, to sub-bail the goods, really um, on, to subcontract on any terms. And the carrier, having received possession of them, sub-bailed the goods to the ship owners. The goods were subsequently damaged and the shipper sought to sue not the carrier, but the ship owners direct. <coughs> 
and the action was commenced in, I think it was the courts of Hong Kong uh, against the ship owners. Now the ship owners response to that was to say, well, in the contract of carriage that we have with the carrier there, there is an exclusive jurisdiction clause in favor of the courts of Taiwan. And they sought to have the action brought by the, the, the shipper against them stayed on the basis of the exclusive jurisdiction clause. Now, the eagle-eyed among you will see, if you look at that relationship, that there was uh, no um, direct contract between the shipper and the ship owners. And if you apply basic contract law to that relationship, you would think that the ship owner's defence based upon the exclusive jurisdiction clause would be met with the very obvious defence of either want of privity of contract or want of consideration. So the shippers weren't privy to the contract in which the exclusive jurisdiction clause was contained um, and the shippers had not given consideration to the ship owners for that promise. So those two principles, um, whether they're different or just two sides of the same coin, would seem to preclude the um, would seem to preclude the claim uh, in breach of the uh, sorry would seem to preclude the defence that the claim is in breach of the exclusive jurisdiction clause. Nevertheless, the Privy Council held that the shipper was bound, and you see this very um, important principle articulated by Lord Gough in the passage that I've put up there on uh, on the screen. If the effect of the sub, this I should say this is a, a sub-bailment relationship, which I mentioned before. So it's a bailment by the shipper to the carrier, and then a sub-bailment by the carrier to the ship owners. So anyway, as I say, Lord Gough said, if the effect of the sub-bailment is that the sub-bailey voluntarily receives into his custody uh, the goods of the owner, and so assumes towards the owner the responsibility of a bailey, then to the extent that the terms of the sub-bailment are consented to by the owner, or it can properly be said that the owner has authorised the bailey so to regulate the duties of the sub bailey in respect of the goods entrusted to him, not only towards the bailey but also towards the owner. Such a conclusion finding its origin in the law of bailment rather than the law of contract does not depend for its efficacy either on the doctrine of privity of contract or on the doctrine of consideration. So the um, principle which is articulated in the case is that because the shipper had essentially authorised the carrier to subcontract on terms which ex included the exclusive jurisdiction clause, the shipper was bound by that clause. But it's crucial to understand that there is nothing in the reasoning which bases that on any kind of implied contract arising between the shipper and the ship owners. That's the um, really important point there. So in a sense, the doctrine of bailment on terms, as it's called, was used to outflank the duties in tort that would other, otherwise arise between the shipper and the ship owners. And the, the principle was carried, it seems, even further in a case called Sandeman Copramar, uh, which I've put in the second bullet point there. And in that case, um, the uh, sub bailey in the scheme had actually assumed greater obligations than those which would be imposed under the, the general common law. And in Sandeman, the, the person in the position of the bailor was held entitled to extract the benefit of those enhanced promises from the bailey. So just going back, you can see it would be the equivalent of the shipper suing the ship owners there on the basis of some positive and additional obligation that the ship owners had undertaken. So whereas in the Pioneer Container, um, it was a case of the ship owners trying to take advantage of a restriction on their liability um, in a contract to which the shipper was not a party. Here it would, in the uh, Sandiman situation that I'm thinking about, it would be a case of the shipper trying to take advantage of some increased or augmented duty on the part of the ship owners uh, in a contract to which it, the shipper was not a party. Now, from what I've said, um, uh, talking about bailment as, as a relationship which um, is uh, a division of legal reversion often ownership from possession, you might think that it would be fairly straightforward to distinguish between um, perhaps on the one hand, a, an outright transfer of property in the form of a gift of, uh, or a sale, on the other, um, a, a trust under which 
only equitable interest is clipped off and a bailment in the middle under which possession moves but not the, uh, the legal interest. But actually you find from time to time that it's not at all easy to distinguish between these sorts of trans different sorts of transactions. And I've put up on screen there um, a, a, a covenant um, which I have taken from a, an old deed that passed across my table a couple of years back, which concerned a gift, a 19th century gift by, I've called him the Earl. All I'll say is he wasn't an Earl, he was a something else, but um, I've called him the Earl for the purposes of this, um, this covenant. And um, it, it, was a, it was an old, um, dusty, uh, formal deed of gift from, um, fr from, from an old Earl, one of the, the predecessors to the title, to the, to the present Earl. And under the terms of the gift, um, uh, some artifacts uh, had been given to a local museum, which was being set up to seed the museum. I think it was about the middle of the 19th century. And there were what were expressed to be words of gift. But then the gift was made conditional on the covenant that I've set out there. So it was made um, conditional upon condition that the following covenant is observed by the corporation. That was the, uh, the effectively the museum that was being seeded with these things. Um, so upon condition that the following covenant is observed by the corporation, covenant with the Earl, his heirs and assigns at all times forever hereafter to exhibit the same collection freely to the public at all proper and reasonable times, according to the way leaves or customs of the museum in default whereof at any time the said paintings shall revert and be restored to the Earl, his heirs assigns or be disposed of as he or they may direct in default of such restoration, the Earl, his heirs assigns shall be at liberty peaceably to enter the museum and remove the same without hindrance from the corporation. Now, if you look at that, um, not anything hugely surprising perhaps about the idea that lies beneath it, which is that there were to be some restrictions on the way in which the corporation or the museum was, was to deal with these, um, in this example, these paintings. Um, but when you actually start to analyze what the legal relationship that was being created between the Earl and indeed um, his successors or heirs, um, on the one hand and the corporation on the other was, it became more confusing. Um, one might think, the equity lawyer might think, oh, well, here we have a trust. But there was nothing in the wording of the, um, of the disposition of the gift itself that was consistent with a trust at all. Um, it, it didn't look like natural language for trust. You may then think, well, okay, um, it's a gift, but subject to a condition. But that immediately comes up against problems. Uh, in particular, the principle I think I mentioned it earlier, that there are, that there are really no estates or limited interests at common law, at common law, not under trust, but at common law, in relation to chattels. So uh, ownership is really the only interest, legal proprietary interest, that the law recognises. Um, and the one exception, perhaps the secondary interest, is the limited interest of the bailey with possession. But if you look at this, it's clear that the uh, that the earl the, the earl is being left with some kind of what appears to be some kind of proprietary interest to recover possession in the event of a breach. So it's not really very easy to identify what that interest is under basic principles of personal property law. Um, you might regard this as some kind of bailment. Is it um, really the case that the that the Earl is being the Earl's family is being left with legal ownership, um, and only possession in some qualified manner is being sent over to the corporation or the museum? But again, that's not really consistent with the language of gift, which was quite quick, clearly expressed in the first part of the deed. So it's it, it was a very very difficult transaction to um, to try and unscramble. That takes me to um, this point, which I just want to make uh, quickly, which is that although, as I said a moment ago, um, there is really no doctrine of estates in relation to personal property and that the Bailey's interest is the only limited interest, you can find um, some marginal cases at the edge, some unusual um, quirky uh, sorts of interests which really don't completely fit into that scheme. 
um, conditional gifts uh, don't really seem seem to work um, within that that scheme that I've set out there. But there are examples. There is um, at least one example of um, what you might think of as um, a system of successive gifts, which operate at common law. And this is the idea of um, successive testamentary bequests of chattels. So you can, under a will, leave property to A for life and thereafter to B. And it seems that that is a kind of a structure that the law will enforce if it's contained in a gift without interposing a trust. Um, it's a very unusual idea. Um, modern um, authority tends to regard this as um, giving the holder absolute property, but some kind of limited shows in action to the second um, downstream, second person who's to enjoy the property to, uh, to, to, to obtain possession after the um, life of the first has ended. And so you can draw on some of these sort of marginal or outer edge cases perhaps to try and push the boundaries of what the law will allow uh, when you're trying to analyze or interpret that kind of, um, that kind of an arrangement there. Um, the last slide here is about blurring the boundaries. Uh, it's important to recognize that although, even where you can say quite clearly what the relationship is at the beginning, that relationship can um, morph from trust to bailment or from bailment to trust. Um, and I've put up an example here of the situation of the agent who sells his bailor's property. So again, in the art context, take the situation of um, a dealer who is, um, to whom a, a work is consigned uh, by the owner for the purposes of sale. Dealer takes possession of it and the dealer therefore becomes the bailey of it. Um, let's say the dealer then sells the work in an authorised fashion and receives proceeds of sale into his bank account uh, and then uh, holds those proceeds of sale. Now what began then as a bailment relationship, which is a relationship that arguably has no trust um, aspect whatsoever, pure common law bailment uh, from owner to dealer, by virtue of the authorised sale then becomes a trust relationship in relation to the proceeds of sale. The proceeds of sale are not capable of being the subject matter of a bailment because bailment only applies to chattels. Uh, but the proceeds of sale are held by the dealer and you're then into the perhaps what's a fairly conventional inquiry for an equity lawyer as to whether or not the agent at that point um, holds them only subject to a, an obligation to account, personal obligation to account, or whether some kind of trust interest is impressed on the proceeds of sale because they represent the traceable proceeds of the work of art. And that's the kind of question that crops up uh, often in retention of title cases um, where the, the buyer um, who's, who's um, so the buyer has taken possession of the seller's um, item uh, on a retention of title basis, hasn't yet paid for it. Seller therefore maintains that even though it's in the buyer's possession, it's, um, it's still his property, it gets sold and um, the proceeds of sale come into his hands and he goes insolvent. So it's an insolvency situation that often tests that kind, of, um, that kind of question as to personal accountability or trust. Um, another example which I've put up here, which is quite interesting, is the question of the thief of the artwork. Now, the thief steals the artwork um, and absconds with it. Uh, what is the situation, what is the, 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 the type of um, relationship that the thief has with the, uh, the owner of the artwork after the theft, um, besides the obvious, which is not, a, I suppose, not a very good one. But from a legal perspective, what is it? Well, um, if you go back to that well-known dictum of um, Lord Brown Wilkinson in West Deutsche, you might argue that the thief is a constructive trustee of the work of art because he's stolen it. But that is an analysis which has problems. Um, I think, in fact, the current edition of Lewin um, is quite is more explicit about these problems than, than, than the last edition. And the main problem is that the thief, of course, hasn't taken legal title by virtue of the theft, because English law operates the principle nemo dat quod non habet. So you don't ob ob obtain legal ownership by stealing. 
The thief, therefore, simply has possession. And you might think, well, the thief, the thief is not a, obviously not a bailee in the sense that he's not holding his possessory interest respectfully of the true owner. He's holding it in a way which is adverse um, uh, to the true owner, like an adverse possessor. But nevertheless, he has possession. Um, the legal owner still has ownership. So is the thief um, in a position which is essentially analogous to a position of a bailee? Is he in a position which is analogous to a position of a finder? Um, some listening will have studied the law of finding, perhaps back at university, and will remember that the finder owes certain obligations to the true owner um, to look after the goods um, while they're in his possession, to take steps to see that the goods are reunited with the true owner, and so on. Could you construct a system of duties which uh, are similar and impose them on the thief? Um, but it may also be helpful to overlook the problems with Lord Brown Wilkinson's uh, analysis of constructive trusteeship and say, well, actually, look, I want to treat the thief as though he's a constructive trustee because it suits my purposes for the purposes of tracing. I want to be able to, um, to, to trace the proceeds of sale when the thief sold the work on to a buyer. Um, and I want to trigger the equitable tracing remedies and in order to tr trigger the equitable tracing remedies, the, the, the thief has to be regarded as in a position of a trustee uh, so as to introduce the fiduciary relationship, which is traditionally said to start the tracing exercise off. And so I want to regard him in that way. So you can, there's an element here, as I say, of blurring the boundaries and perhaps picking um, the analysis which suits you best. Um, the last point here, which I just want to make, which, is, which um, flows perhaps from that, um, a question of characterization in relation to the thief is just to think about other circumstances in which you might want to blur the boundaries. And one place which I've often wondered about in, in, in this is the situation of the Bailey um, who holds a work and doesn't really know what to do with it. Um, perhaps an involuntary Bailey who's had um, work left with him and the Bay laws disappeared from the scene. And it's not, a, it's not at all a fanciful idea. There are many, many museum collections, I'm sure, um, where you would find that the Bailey um, has received loans, um, uh, um, parts of their collection which were never intended to be um, outright gifts. And they may have been received many, many years ago. And it's just simply not possible to trace the, the person who um, bailed them or the heir of the person who bailed them. Now if you regard the museum in this example as purely a bailee, they're in a very difficult position because the law that relates to uh, what a bailee um, can do with uh, items which have been left with them uh, on terms that render them an involuntary bailee. Involuntary bailee is sort of a um, a contradiction in terms because the essence of bailment is that the, bail the bailee must be voluntarily in possession but involuntary bailee really covers a situation it's an inconvenient label for covering a situation where the bailee finds themselves holding things that they they don't want either because they've been sent unsolicited or because um, the original terms of their possession ha have expired the bail laws disappeared those sorts of situations. So if you've got a museum that's a, an involuntary bailey, what do they do? Well, as I say, that the, the rights of an involuntary bailey to dispose of, um, you know, uh, aban for want of a better word, abandoned works or works that they can't um, trace the owner of, are very, very, very limited. And I've, I've often thought that the bailey in this respect is something of a poor relation of a trustee who, of course, has very, very powerful rights under Part 64 to go to the court for directions. So if you've got a trustee who's unable to identify the true beneficiary of the work, the trustee would, of course, go off quick smart to the court under Part 64, make an application for directions. What should I do with the work? Um, what steps should I take in relation to the work? And if the trustee does that and complies with the directions that the court gives him, then the trustee is not going to be liable for breach of trust in respect of the steps that he takes. There's absolutely no equivalent whatsoever for the bailee. So to go back to the point about blurring the boundaries, I've sometimes wondered whether it might be possible for the bailee in this situation 
to try to sneak himself into part 64 on the basis that he is in fact some kind of a trustee. Now he's going to face the same sorts of problems as, as, as the thief in that his relationship really isn't a relationship of, of trust, as I've said. But the, the Bailey does have a kind of a limited interest in the goods, as I've also said, um, which is his possession held subject to the terms of the bailment. And you might question, for example, whether the Bailey might say, well, that is itself a legal interest. That legal interest may be held on trust for somebody. Uh, and if you can get that far, he might be able to invoke part 64. I suspect probably not because it would rely upon the law accepting that there was a concept of almost equitable possession, um, that the Bailey's legal possessory interest was held on trust for somebody. And that is a, an idea which I think would, would, would be difficult for the law to accept as um, set out in that passage there, which I've quoted from Bridge on the Law of Personal Property. But it might just be possible for the Bailey to work some, some kind of argument up. So um, there I finish. The, the boundaries can be blurred um, and it can sometimes be useful as well as a hindrance. Now, um, I'm, going, I'm going there to come up for air and I'm going to put, the, uh, put, put it out for questions. So if anybody wants to ask any questions, now is your time. I've got the question and answer box up and I've got no open questions being, um, being, being, uh, being shown. So it may be that you're all stunned or bored into uh, um, silence. But if anybody does want to ask anything, then, um, then now is the time to ask. No, no takers. Well, I think this is a first. I'm not sure if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but. Um, I'll, I'll take it anyway. Um, okay, well in that case, I think um, uh, th that brings us to the end of the seminar. As I said at the beginning, if anybody wants to ask me anything offline arising out of any of this, um, then please do feel free to get in touch. But um, otherwise, have a good afternoon.